Good evening and welcome. My name is Barbara Altman. I am the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, a position I took over from Steve Shankman last September. My remarks will be very brief, and then I'll hand off to Steve, who will give our eminent speaker the introduction she deserves. It's an honor for the Oregon Humanities Center to present Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker this evening as our 2008-2009 Cressman Lecturer in the Humanities. The Luther S. and Dorothy Cecilia Cressman Lectureship was established in 1994 with a generous bequest from former UO anthropologist and archaeologist Luther S. Cressman, who excavated the by now famous 10,000-year-old sagebrush bark sandals from a cave in central Oregon in 1938. He questioned some of the received theories about the prehistoric Northwest Great Basin and pushed forward in very important ways our understanding of the human history of this region. The lectureship's goal is, and I quote, the presentation and illumination of fundamental humanities issues that confront, but are too often ignored by, societies centrally occupied with science, technology, and business, unquote. We have used this lectureship for speakers in the fields of anthropology, religion, art and art history, natural history, and cultural studies. Among the guests who have come as Cressman lecturers are N. Scott Momaday, pioneer of modern Native American literature, who also pioneered this series, and Randall Robinson, the international human rights activist. Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker will add luster to the lectureship with her talk this evening which serves as the opening keynote, as I'm sure you are all aware, for the Ethics, Religion, and the Environment Symposium sponsored by the Center for Intercultural Dialogue. Before I hand over to Steve, I want to acknowledge publicly the work done in preparing for Professor Tucker's visit by the Oregon Humanities Center staff, Associate Director Julia Hayden, as well as Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, Dylan Bragg, and Nawal Alloway. And I would like to congratulate Steve Shankman and his right-hand woman, Terry Guerrero, for putting together this historic and wonderful meeting of UNESCO chairs. Thank you, Steve and Terry, for bringing this event to Eugene. <laughs> and now I will hand over the mic to Steve, who will introduce Professor Tucker. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Barbara. I want to acknowledge uh, the Humanity Center and their contribution to tonight, uh, to tonight's uh, keynote address, uh, the Cressman Lecture. We couldn't have done it without them. Thank you very much, Barbara, and also to the staff of the Humanity Center. And yes, I'd like to acknowledge Terry, who we all know is absolutely extraordinary. I also want to mention all our volunteers and Kelly Totten, who is the conference coordinator who's done absolutely extraordinary work. So thank you to, to all of you. And there are so many people to thank. I'm going to keep it very short this evening because uh, I, I did want to mention uh, some of the, uh, our major donors who have made this possible. Uh, the Office of the President at the University of Oregon, the Jubitz Family Fund, and uh, we actually have with us tonight, I don't know whether they want to be acknowledged, uh, but uh, we're very grateful to have them here. Al and Ray Jubitz are here from the Jubitz Foundation. So I would like a special round of, of, of applause for, for them. <laughs> Other major uh, help came from Lori Loke, also UNESCO. Uh, it wasn't that easy to do the contracts. <laughs> the bureaucracy was interesting, but we were very grateful. We're very grateful to them. Uh, must have been about a year, a year and a half ago, um, uh, I got a phone call saying, hey, there's this incredible person who's coming to Oregon State, Mary Evelyn Tucker. You should, you know, I hear about your, your conference about uh, that is going to uh, kick off the, the, uh, a, a symposium that will initiate the first UNESCO chair in the Americas and in the Intercultural Dialogue Program. Uh, have a look have a look at Mary Evelyn. So I went, I made the long, long journey to Corvallis <laughs> and uh, I heard Mary Evelyn give a, give a talk and I thought absolutely right on. And it is absolutely fabulous to have Mary Evelyn with us uh, tonight. And we really couldn't have picked a more perfect person 
uh, for this conference on ethics, religion, and the environment to, to uh, give our keynote address. Mary Evelyn Tucker is a senior lecturer in religion and environment at Yale University, holding, and it always sounds so remarkable, joint appointments as a research scholar in the Divinity School and in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. What, what, a, what a fabulous uh, combination and uh, original uh, combination. It's great when you take interdisciplinary uh, work to that, uh, uh, to that level. Also, the Department of Religious Studies uh, at, at Yale, she's associated with. With John Grimm, she co-founded the Forum on Religion and Ecology, FOR. Tucker and Grimm also coordinated a 10-conference series on world religions and ecology at Harvard Center for the Study of World Religions. And Mary Evelyn has been a committee member of the Interfaith Partnership for the Environment at the United Nations Environmental Program since 1986 and as vice president of the American Teilhard Association. The author of many books on religion and ecology, she's recently published Worldly Wonder, Religions Enter Their Ecological Phase, uh, Open Court Press. She's the editor of books on ecological views of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Hinduism. And she's published the volume Confucian Spirituality, co-edited with Du Wei Ming, and the record of great uh, doubts, the philosophy of Qi. It's my great privilege to introduce to you tonight, Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker. Well, thanks can't be said enough, and so I'll add to Steve's thanks, and that is thanks to him for the incredible work he's doing here, and to Terry, and to Barbara, and to Julia, and especially uh, to Julia for this wonderful tour I had this afternoon of the trees of this extraordinary campus. And uh, being just at Yale yesterday with Al Jubitz at the Forestry School, where we have a new green building, um, just like this green building, I want to say a special thanks to Al and to my colleagues at Yale for this wonderful opportunity to be as you are here in dialogue with one another, um, because I think this is what's needed so deeply. And I am most humbly, um, and in some fear and trepidation, um, welcoming and wanting to learn and listen from the UNESCO chairs who are here. Uh, this is not an easy thing to address such a marvelously intercultural, interreligious, a group of people, and it's to Steve's credit that he's brought them together. Now, I'm going to speak on this conjunction of religion and ecology that's emerging around the world in many, many interesting and exciting ways. But I want to put forward just at the very beginning here, I'm speaking not necessarily of religion in its institutional and sometimes fossil or brittle forms. Um, but I'm trying to speak of religion. I'm trying to re, everyone says I'm spiritual, not religious, and so on. But I'm saying these religious traditions are profoundly spiritual. They are profoundly spiritual. And they have ethical paths into the future. So we can't begin to create this global community that's emerging without bringing them forward in new forms. That's my message in, in its essence. Um, so I will certainly refer to the problematic side of religion, as we all know, but I just want to say these are extraordinarily valuable cultural traditions, uh, and they matter deeply in our moment. Because we are currently immersed in a global environmental crisis that has, as you know, various manifestations such as pollution of air, water, and soil, and the deterioration of ecosystems around the planet. This is in part because of our explosion from 2 billion to 6 billion people in the 20th century, coupled with rapid industrialization, unlimited consumption, and overarching technological power. In the midst of this crisis, two macro-scale problems have emerged, interrelated yet distinctive. 
One is climate change, and the other is species extinction. I would say the first is becoming visible. The second is still invisible, the species extinction. These aspects of, the, there are aspects of both these problems that are still invisible, in part because of their global reach and immense complexity. It is fair to say that until the Al Gore film here in the States, An Inconvenient Truth, climate change had remained largely invisible to the American public. This is in large part due to the media's misplaced attention to the so-called fairness doctrine that tried to present both sides of the science. This resulted in giving undue attention to the climate skeptics, even though it is well known that many of the reports of these skeptics were funded by the oil companies. Moreover, the attempts by the Bush administration to silence scientists such as Jim Hansen to dismiss the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and to refuse to sign the Kyoto Protocol lost us years of important work in mitigation. The complexities of the issues surrounding climate change are undeniable. However, the consensus from IPCC regarding the anthropogenic or human nature of climate change can no longer be dismissed. This report of over 1,500 scientists from around the world represents the largest collaborative project of science in human history. And the scientists are speaking now about the need for action. Indeed, there was an important editorial in Nature magazine just at the end of April titled, Time to Act. Now, what I'm outlining here, for those of you outside of the US, is this conflict that's occurred within the states between science as it was presented around climate change in the media. It was often the climate skeptics and the scientists were on the same level uh, of, of uh, coverage. And my point, what I'm also going to be driving at, is there's a huge need for an ethical, spiritual, religious component of this discussion. Now, not only because of the media, but, but political and economic concerns have also made it difficult for legitimate climate scientists to be heard. Many have also observed that the language barrier is significant in making complicated science and policy issues clearer to a larger public. For example, the term global warming suggests something that could be good for the planet. All of this has caused frustration and unease among climate scientists, including those studying the problem for decades here in the US at the Colorado National Science for Atmospheric Research. As Jim Hansen puts it, there's a gap between what is understood by the scientists and what is known by the public. And this is true around the world, I think, as well. But I want to just share with you that a conference in Aspen a few years ago, the climate scientists in the US who came to this conference were so deeply frustrated, this was before the Al Gore movie, that they were in despair about why people were not listening to the climate science, because they knew the whole global community was at risk. And some of them um, found this absolutely, uh, to, the, to the point they were literally in therapy, because the despair was so real um, for them. Now, in fairness, it should also be noted that many scientists have seen their role as studying problems, not formulating policy. The objective nature of scientific research needs to be respected. At the same time, there has emerged an urgency regarding the interdisciplinary intersection of science, policy, and ethics around environmental issues in various quarters over the last 15 years, and most recently focused on climate change. And I'm suggesting universities have been part of the problem where science and policy drive academic issues around environment. Um, and I'm suggesting that more is needed for this transition that we're into right now. So the, one of the earliest statements uh, of the call of scientists for the humanities to enter into this discussion was about 15 years ago, in 1992, a warning to humanities, the Union of Concerned Scientists based in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Over 2,000 scientists, many Nobel laureates signed this, 
Um, and it was calling for, this is the quote, a new ethic is required, a new attitude towards discharging our responsibility for caring for ourselves and for the earth. This was one of the first alliances, if you see what I'm talking about, of science and humanity, science and ethics around these issues. Now, five years later, right up here in Seattle, Jane Lubchenco, one of your great scientists um, at, the, at Oregon State, gave her presidential address at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where she called for science to embrace a new contract with society in response to pressing environmental issues. I was there at that talk. She got a standing ovation. As you know, she's now in the administration in Washington, head of NOAA. But it was Jane Lubchenco, one of your Oregonians, who said science cannot be simply objective. It needs to be in the service of society and the larger global community. This is a shift, and a very, very important shift. Um, just yesterday, actually, at Yale, where the new dean who's coming in said, uh, we must have knowledge for action. And students are asking for relevancy of their studies for this huge crisis that we are facing. The work of Bill Clark at Harvard, along with Bob Cates and Bob Carell, to create the field of sustainability sciences can be seen as a robust response to that challenge. Since their article in Science in 2001, there's been a growing interest in bringing the natural and social sciences together around a variety of pressing issues, including sustainable development and climate change. The IPCC report on climate change has also reflected this complex dialogue between science and social science. There's all kinds of arguments going on about what should be said, or should it just be the description, not the prescription. Okay. Now, the contested nature of the role of science as objective research has been at the center of these debates, and it's ongoing at Yale, at Columbia, at the Earth Institute, and so on. So while I'm not proposing a solution to this extremely complex and multifaceted problem, I would suggest that it is worthy of consideration in future, future discussions, and humanity centers have a very important role to play around this. It would appear that sustainability science is growing steadily in this divide between scientific description of problems and policy prescriptions for solutions. The Yale Climate Initiative, for example, indicates this in their subtitle, Integrating Science and Solutions. And we will have the new, the, as head of this new climate initiative, uh, Picari, who's been chairing the IPCC, will come to Yale um, to chair this. At the same time as the natural and social sciences are finding new collaborative partnerships, the humanities are beginning to contribute, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to contribute as well. While environmental history and literature are growing, philosophy and religious studies are joining the discussions. Within the field of philosophy, environmental ethics has a history of some four decades, beginning with the work of Baird Callicott and Holmes Rawston in the early 1970s. There has been a growth of publications by environmental ethicists, although they are searching still for a way, way to link more directly and effectively to policy discussions. In this last decade and a little bit more, a new field of religion and ecology has emerged within academia. Its rapid growth has been nothing less than remarkable, and its potential to affect change is significant because of the institutional dimensions of the world's religions. There's a billion, more than a billion Christians, there's more than a billion uh, Muslims, there's more than a billion Hindus, there's more than a billion Confucian uh, peoples in China. And what I want to uh, signal here, when we began, John Grimm is my husband, and when we began this conference series at Harvard, it was precisely because environmental ethics has been a very significant field, but it's based primarily on Western philosophy, and it's not taking into consideration the cultural values and religious diversity of various parts of the world. And those of us who study Asia in particular, China and India, realized, um, of course, as we all realize now, that China and India will change the face of the planet as they are industrializing, as they are modernizing. And uh, while we can all say, don't do what we did, um, people want the same kinds of modern luxuries uh, and so on. So what are, what's the equity issues here? 
Um, this is clearly developed, developing world, first world, third world, um, and so on. Um, I want to signal here a thinker who's sitting in the audience, Chet Bowers, who's given a huge amount of thought to world views, which is what we're also trying to bring into the mix. What, what constitutes the worldview of modernity? He's been one of the great critics of modernity and the problems that it has created with hyper-individualism and lack of community um, and so on. So we're very much in alignment with, with his work, and we're trying, to, as I say, to bring in this diversity of cultural values. Um, clearly, as the Chinese speak to this issue, it's not going to have an Islamic flavor, except in Central Asia. Um, it's going to have a Confucian, Buddhist, and Taoist flavor. And uh, we met last summer with the Deputy Prime Minister for the Environment, Pan Yue, who is exceedingly interested in using Confucian values for an environmental ethics in China. And they have translated the three volumes um, from this Harvard series into Chinese. Now, this is against great odds. <laughs> There's a billion people in China. Uh, this is a rapid, relentless modernity that's, that's going forward, and it's very difficult to uh, put a stop in that kind of process. But it is saying respecting cultural and religious diversity is absolutely crucial to forming a, a global community that's going to be sustainable in the long run. So that was the... Uh, the heart of this conference series at Harvard, over 1,800 people came from around the world. It included indigenous, um, a, a whole conference on indigenous peoples from every uh, planet. Um, Shinto is the largest gathering of Shinto outside of Japan that had ever taken place. And it culminated with two conferences in New York at the United Nations and at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, you know, a thousand people came, but it was also in dialogue with people from science, from the world of education, uh, from policy and economics, because we were trying to say the religious communities, again, broadly conceived, um, have to be partners with those who've been working on environmental issues for a long, long time. Religions have come late to this issue, and yet they have something clearly to offer. So religions are necessary but not sufficient. Um, the, the sense, then, um, of what we were trying to do in this three-year uh, conference series, and now based at Yale, this forum that Steve mentioned, was what many of you are probably trying to do in your own countries as you look at, at modernity and its cost, and you look at tradition and uh, its problematic side, too. So what we were trying to say is, how can we retrieve aspects of these traditions how can we re-examine them in light of modernity and its problems and challenges, and how can we reconstruct them? And we're suggesting, as this book that Steve mentioned, is religions are moving into their ecological phase, uh, and that there will be, if they don't, <laughs> they will disintegrate, and many of the mainline churches uh, in the US are losing membership because they're not speaking to these issues uh, that are pressing. And I would say, I think we can all agree here, and Oregon has led the way in so many areas of, of um, smart growth and, and so on, and you have many land issues and forest issues here. Um, but I think that we can all agree that this environmental problem with its many manifestations, including climate change and biodiversity and toxicities and so on, um, this is the largest, or these are the largest and most complex problems humans have ever had to face in our 150 years of being humans on this planet. We are at a very critical historical moment, and I think we all sense that, um, and we are looking for a way forward. Um, now, one of the first projects that we did after this conference series is what you have on your, your paper there, and that was bringing together um, representatives from the different world's religions and beginning to focus on climate change. And uh, we had people speaking from the climate science, as well as Bill McKibben, who's become one of the very strong spokespersons um, on this issue. And uh, then the ethics was folded in with Donald Brown. Um, I would like to just highlight a few of the things that are happening in terms of this conjunction of religion and climate change. And 
Uh, I'm going to move towards the end of the talk to suggest a, a range of ethical issues that need to be highlighted uh, around climate change. Um, but nationally here in the U.S., there's a whole group of people who are working, you may probably have a group here in Oregon, called Interfaith Power and Light that is working on auditing churches and synagogues and changing light bulbs to be more fuel efficient and so on. Um, you also have statements that have come out of the Bishops' Conference in uh, Washington, D.C. On, on global warming. Uh, they just did one uh, for the on Earth Day, actually, a, a new St. Francis Covenant. Now, some of these are not fully adequate to the task, but I just want to suggest that they are emerging. The, glo the global warming statement of the bishops is actually um, fairly good. Um, internationally, the World Council of Churches has been working on climate change for a long, long time. David Hallman, a Canadian, has followed this very, very carefully in uh, in the negotiations, the COP negotiations, and so on, for more than a dozen years. The Vatican, uh, as you may know, is carbon neutral, or moving towards being carbon neutral. I was at a conference on climate change at the Vatican about a year and a half ago, um, where you will be probably disturbed to know that climate skeptics were invited, um, but soon moved to the periphery. Uh, it wasn't a huge conference, and so um, they they uh, did not rule the, the roost, but I think there's some hope that the Pope will actually do an encyclical on the environment, a letter to the, the faithful, and that will reach a billion people. Um, now, again, all of this is um, by way of saying not only within the religions things are emerging, and I also want to just highlight two other cases uh, very briefly, and we can talk about this in the discussion period. Up in Alberta, Canada, where you know the tar sand, uh, the extraction of oil from this, the tar shale up there, has created thousands of acres of absolute destruction. And the Bishop of Alberta has called this environmental devastation, and this is a moral issue, and, and spoken very strongly. In the Philippines, the, I happen to use examples from the bishops at this moment, but there's many other religions uh, that are doing this kind of work. But the bishops in the Philippines did a statement 20 years ago called, we're destroying our beautiful land. But the one that just came out in December in the Philippines is saying, we should have a moratorium on mining, on forestry, and all other extractive industries because it is such a serious situation. And again, I think many of you coming from various parts of the world know what the cost of, of this is. Um, the, uh, the sense is not only emerging within the religions, I want to simply highlight that a number of groups like the Club of Rome, who've been working on sustainability issues uh, for, for a very long time, for three decades at least, um, the Talberg Forum in Sweden, Gorbachev has had uh, several conferences called Earth Dialogues is Ethics, the Missing Link. In the European community, a lot of this activity has emerged that's been very heavily sustainability and um, science driven, but more recently, within the last 10 years, in involving also the ethical and spiritual issues. Gorbachev, incidentally, uh, you know, has been one of the great leaders of this sensibility, and um, I worked on the Earth Charter with, um, with, he was one of the chairs of that. But Gorbachev has recognized um, the environmental state of the planet for a very long time, and also that this is a profoundly spiritual issue. Um, let me then recapitulate a few points. Um, and before I do that, I wanna just come back also to Asia. Um, as I mentioned, China is very interested in exploring uh, their own traditions, but we also met in Korea, Last, um, last spring, and the, their academy is very keen to do a whole uh, PhD in Confucianism and ecology. They've spoken to the Minister of the Environment and the Minister of Education in Korea to do a K through 12 program on how Confucianism and ecology uh, could be part of the curriculum. And we were in Taiwan in January, where this interest is also uh, emerging. Again, I'm not saying this is you know, instant, it's not going to happen overnight, and so on. But cultural values matter, for sure. 
And um, so I'm just signaling some, some of the changes. The Greek Orthodox patriarch um, has been one of the very key leaders of this uh, issue. He's based in, in Istanbul, but he has done water symposium all throughout Europe and also in the Amazon, in Greenland, and you will be very happy to know, we've, we've been on a number of these, but he's coming to the, to the states in October to do one on the Mississippi River as well to highlight the problems that are right, right here. He was waiting for a certain shift in the uh, government um, to come back. <laughs> so, um, okay, now let me recapitulate then a few points here uh, about religion and ecology, and then I'll go into this final part on ethics and uh, climate change. So what I'm suggesting is that religion and ecology is a newly emerging field around the world uh, but it's not more than really a dozen years old. Environmental ethics, on the other hand, comes out of Western philosophy and is about 40 years old, and again, around the world. The historians of religion and theologians have a great deal of work still to be done, but they need to be doing it in dialogue with scientists, economists, and policymakers. Now, secondly, Religious and ethical perspectives have only recently been invited into the area of sustainability sciences and sustainability forums, which are arenas within academia and beyond. And they are trying to uh, learn this language of a synergy between these various disciplines. Thirdly, academia tends to frown on research or teaching that is advocacy-oriented. Yet many academics aspire to be relevant to, ta to today's world, and clearly our students do. This is one of the most inspiring things about being at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and that is these are students, like some of you here tonight, who have grown up with more knowledge of the environmental problems than any of us in our generation, and you still want to make a difference. That is what's so inspiring about these students at Yale and elsewhere um, who are so smart, could do a whole range of things, um, but they want to get in there and make their contribution. And they are from around the world, uh, which is also very exciting. Um, now, this, this is a fine line to negotiate, again, as Chet, I think, has indicated. You know, what, what does it mean to, be, uh, to have an advocacy type of position in academia is not simple. Um, but I think we need to negotiate this so that academics do not become just within the ivory tower. Now, fourth, while academia is some, somewhat comfortable with environmental ethics arising out of Western philosophy, it is perplexed by or adverse to the study of religion in universities, often confusing it with theology. Theology is basically the study of Christian belief within a confessional mode and done in seminaries. But the study of religion is a academic discipline. Uh, I'm a historian of religion. There are anthropologists of religion, sociologists of religion, and so on. Um, let me make two further points here. The history of religions, as I've just said, is not theology. It is the study of the unfolding of various religious traditions, including changes and continuities over time. It is more indebted to history and the social sciences than theology. The history of religions identifies ethics within the context of world religions and cultures, not simply within a Western philosophical framework. Let me observe that Christian ethics has focused primarily on social ethics and not environmental ethics until very recently. Um, and indeed, one of the ob curious obstacles is that from the Jewish and Christian and Islamic tradition, the notion of justice is, has been so strong, but largely within the human framework. And so when I first came to another university where I was teaching a very strong University of Chicago, a uh, social ethicist said, oh, environment, that's whitewater rafting. You know, it's totally irrelevant to a justice and ethical perspective. So we have a lot to overcome in bringing together the human nature dialectic. And that is at the heart of everything I'm speaking about tonight, that this is 
about more than changing light bulbs. It's about more than techno technological fixes or energy audits even. It is about a vast and complex and still little understood change in human nature relations. We are redefining ourselves as planetary citizens, and it's going to change everything. And you know what? We don't have the language to do it yet. We're in process. We are discovering it. And, you, and people will say, can we do it fast enough to make the changes? Look what's sitting right here, these UNESCO chairs. I think we can do it fast enough to make the changes. But it is a profound, inexorable, spiritual and ethical process, and we can't leave that out even in academia that likes to keep it out. That's what I'm speaking about here. It must, it is central to who we are as humans. The meaning dimension of life cannot be ignored as we make this change into a sustainable future. A sustainable future isn't just a technological change. It's way deeper, way deeper. Now, let me say then again that so we understand the problems and promise of religion. Religions can be rigid and dogmatic. They can also be flexible and changing. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate in studying these traditions that are multi-millennia old traditions. They have changed, and they will change over time, often with contestation. Secondly, religions, the problem side is they have exclusive claims to truth, they can be dogmatic, but they can have genuine moral authority. The civil rights movement was deeply inspired, both in its origins in the, the Quaker abolitionist movement in England. This was a moral issue. Slavery was a moral problem. The civil rights movement in the 60s was driven um, by a moral sensibility, and that made the change possible. Thirdly, otherworldly concerns have been important in world religions, but also valuing this, this world. An incarnational sensibility of Christianity is profoundly this world oriented. Matter matters. The Confucian sensibility as well. East Asia is very much this worldly oriented. Um, Fourth, hierarchy. There's lots of hierarchy, and we can say things about women's issues and so on in all of the, the world's religions, for sure. But the world's religions also stand for equity, justice, and fairness, and it's bringing that forward into this new dynamic sensibility. On the problematic side, we can say they're interested in present sectarian concerns, which we see throughout our society today. Absolutely fascinated on how are we going to keep these fossils going, right, and the culture wars and so on. But they're also concerned about future generations, and that to me is the key. And I mean future generations of all species, not only the human. What is it to maintain the beauty of the forests of the Pacific Northwest, as Gary Snyder said, for the next millennium? For the next millennium. What does that mean? When I was up in the Pacific Northwest and the Corvallis visit, I talked to the, those who were studying the spotted owl, the scientists up there in, in the forests. It was so moving because they do not know whether those owls will actually survive uh, the patchwork of the forest. That, and that's true around the world. This deep sensibility that we have of loss in this moment and yet a possibility for change is part of this religious spiritual dynamic because we're trying to foster hope against all odds. And that is what a spiritual and ethical sensibility can do for future generations. And finally, religions, as I've said, have a concentration on human rights, but also is emerging a sense of rights of nature, rights of creation itself. And if we put all of these problems and promise into just two, I would suggest that the world's religions, yes, they have been anthropocentric, often human-oriented, but they also have within their traditions an immense possibility to be anthropocosmic, 
anthropocosmic. And I would suggest Eastern Christianity in its Russian Orthodox and its Greek Orthodox form has that sense of the microcosm of the human, the macrocosm of the universe, and that we are pulsating live beings within a living and sacred universe. This is very much part of the world's religions. So that anthropocosmic sensibility, we are not simply economic animals. And certainly, our present financial meltdown is showing that. We are not just consumers, clearly. And consumption has led to dis-ease, huge dis-ease in our own society. So finally then, let me turn to the ethical challenges of climate change to suggest in what ways the world's religions might become effective partners regarding the ethical implications of this all-encompassing challenge, all-encompassing challenge. And by the way, I do think this sense of challenge and intergenerational handshake is what we need to give those in our schools, our universities, or not in our schools and universities, but we need to give that challenge to the next generation. We are here with you. We are here for you. We invite you into this transition. And I think that's why the politics of this, this last year has said this next generation wants to be involved. They want to make a difference, clearly. Um, my primary point, then, is this partnership needs to be about long-term thinking, namely for longer-range interest in the stock market or quarterly financial reports. The long-term means highlighting the common good of the Earth community, people, species, land, water, air, and future generations. It means, fundamentally, holding up a deep sense of wonder, awe, and beauty. Wonder, awe, and beauty at the immense complexity in which we dwell and have our being and have our hopes and dream. This is a dreaming blue-green planet, and we are the reflexive people on this dreaming blue-green planet. And that's the partnership, too, with science. Scientists are much inspired by this immense complexity and intricacy from the cell, the atom, to the stars and the galaxies, these layered, nested elements of complexity, which we are only beginning to understand. And I would suggest this partnership of religion, science, and ethics especially can be, not yet, but it will be, around this sensibility that we are part of a universe story that is 13.7 billion years old of cosmic evolution, 4.5 billion years old of Earth evolution, that we as latecomers to this amazing process, this truly sacred universe, we are only 150,000 years of Homo sapiens sapiens. And the big challenge is how we will earn the sapiens part of that title, how we will earn it, how we become life-enhancing beings on a life-giving planet. This is a life-giving planet. We want to be life-enhancing beings working with these processes. OK, here's the, the conclusion. For the essential ethical question is, what does the flourishing of the Earth community require? What does it require? That's our ethical question. Here are a few suggestions. <clears throat> it requires a deep understanding of the intrinsic value of nature. It's not utilitarian. It's not just for our own use. The intrinsic value of nature. You live in one of the most beautiful parts of the planet. You know this in your souls. That's why you live here. It's something that brings you alive in ways that no city probably uh, will ever. You live in a magical, extraordinary part of the world, the Northwest Coast, this immense discovery of what this lecture was endowed by 10,000 years of people living, breathing with these forests, with this, this greenery 
with this extraordinarily complex ecosystem. 10,000 years. In 100 years, we have changed it greatly all across the planet. So this sense then of preserving the flourishing of nature is of immense importance for the continuity of life itself, for the continuity of life itself. We need to be reminded of this complexity, of the cycles of air and water and soil. The biodiversity that lives amidst these systems are of inestimable worth. It's not a financial value that you can put onto this diversity. Um, so this sensibility then, could we be the cause of the destruction of creation that has taken so long to evolve? That's the question we are facing. Could we be the cause of destruction of creation that has taken so long to evolve? So intrinsic value of nature. Secondly, environmental degradation is an ethical issue. It's a moral issue. It is absolutely a moral issue. To reverse the role of humans in destroying the atmosphere and thereby adversely affecting all ecosystems and causing biodiversity loss so that we are in a sixth extinction period, a sixth extinction period, which means we are changing it on the level of a geological era. We are ending the Cenozoic era because of our presence on the planet and the loss of biodiversity. Um, thirdly, <clears throat> environmental rights for present and future generations. It will be absolutely necessary to expand the notion of human rights to include environmental rights to a healthy atmosphere and biosphere for future generations. To do this, we need to consider the rights to information, public participation, and justice regarding environmental issues. And this has been set forth in the Aarhus uh, Convention in 1994. Fourth, distributive justice. We will need to consider our moral responsibility to the poor and to those most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. The millions of impoverished on the coastal areas of Bangladesh and other parts of the world, millions and millions of people. The hundreds of thousands of African Americans in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. I'm driving to the airport this morning to Kennedy and talking to a friend who is driving me. We have been able in New York to rebuild every stadium in the last couple years. Mets, Yankees, and Jets. We've not been able to rebuild New Orleans. Incredible. Yankee Stadium alone is over a billion dollars. There are tickets behind home plate that are $1,200 a shot. Yes, exactly. And it's showing up on the TV. <laughs> distributive justice. Distributive justice. Even the elderly in Europe. 50,000 people died from the heat wave in 2004 in Europe, 15,000 in, uh, in, in Paris alone. The group of small island nations are already suing the developed world, and the US in particular, in the UN. The Tuvalu citizens are being relocated to New Zealand in, from the Pacific Island. Fifth, the precautionary principle. It's very hard for Americans to take in any notion of a precautionary principle, even though Barry Commoner told us years ago, stop it at the source and you won't have a problem um, at the other end. But we need to invoke this sensibility, even as we will be arguing about cap and trade or carbon tax and so on and so forth, these various economic uh, possibilities. But the deeper sensibility is, how are we going to cut back at the source? Jim Hansen, the NASA scientists, are saying we must do away with, uh, with coal-burning plants. Six, unintended consequences. And this is part of long-range thinking, which religious communities have done and can do. Unintended consequences of our action. Um, for example, I'll just say for example, biofuel, and the food crisis. We created a crisis around the world, thinking we're going to solve. This is where technological fixes have unbelievable unintended consequences. And again, Chet has pointed out how technology has changed the human uh, from 
deeper processes of who we are as humans. Now, seventh, renewable energy. This is something we need hardly say anything about, but renewable energy is actually a moral issue in so many ways. I would suggest it's not only searching for physical energy, such as sun and water and biomass, but in fact, renewable energy is a renewable energy of the human spirit that is deeply on the edge of uncertainty and despair and lack of clarity about our purpose, our role, and our future. And humans are the one species on the planet who have the ability to imagine a future. The, that's what distinguishes us from other animals. We are animals who can dream a future. And that is the challenge here in both renewable energies of our spirit and physical energies in the world itself. Eighth, technology transfer is an absolute moral issue. The obligation to transfer appropriate technology to the developed world to assist climate change and mitigation. Um, how can we develop the economic means and political will to transfer this knowledge, as we have promised in treaty after treaty, treaty but not fulfilled? Ninth, consumption and affluence. There's a huge way the religions can make a contribution. Having more or being more. Um, we need to examine clearly how 4% of the world's population uh, can use 25% of the world's resources, as we do here in the US. Even Pakari, the head of the IPCC report, says simple things like eating less meat. I've been vegetarian for 30 years. I'm sure many of you had and way before climate change. It happened because I was in, living in Japan in the early 70s, and there was no meat. So I'm not saying this is a big moral issue for me, but most people around the world you know, have not consumed this kind of meat and the destruction of forests and so on that this involves. Um, there's something called water transparency now for one piece of meat, how much water goes into the feeding of the cattle and the, and the land and, and so on. Um, so we can say a lot about consumption, carbon footprint, ecological footprint, how we build uh, in, in different ways, and our agricultural processes, all of that. Finally, population growth. I began by saying in one century, we, we went from 2 billion to 6 billion people and growing. Clearly, we've got to sort out the possibilities of, of a sustainable future in terms of population. A great deal of this not expected in UN uh, <clears throat> conferences and so on was education of women changed the picture radically, absolutely radically. Um, so what, is, what are the limits to this kind of growth? Um, and what does it mean for one person in the first world here in America and one person in India or elsewhere in terms of equity and justice. Now let me end, um, and I hope I haven't given you too much, but enough to feed on, but let me end with what I think is one of the most promising dimensions of this ethical flourishing, this discussion that's coming forward on all these issues and doesn't exhaust them all. And that is the Earth Charter that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And Gorbachev was one of the leaders of that, along with Maurice Strong um, up in Canada, a business person. It came out of the Earth Summit in 1992, the Rio Summit. It took almost 10 years to actually uh, work out all the language of it. And I happened to be for three years on the International Drafting Committee. It was an amazing process, truly amazing. And what I like to say to my students is there are many people around the world, including lawyers, people from women's group, educators, business people, and so on, who came to these meetings, 25 of us around a table, only two, about three or four where English was their first language. They came flying through the night. They came at the, like you, from various countries trying to make this difference. This sense of giving forward and ethical spiritual vision. Let me just very, very briefly say why I think it's such an important document. The preamble contains, as no other international document does, this cosmological evolutionary sensibility. It says, we are part of a vast evolving universe. Earth itself is alive 
with a myriad community of life. That came out of a drafting committee meeting of just three people, one of them an astrophysicist, uh, another myself and a Confucian scholar. The astrophysicists from Harvard and from Tufts wanted this huge evolutionary process. We are part of a vast evolving universe. But he also put in, Earth is alive. And the native peoples who were part of this drafting committee, and when Gorbachev held it up in Rio in 1997, the native peoples who had been involved in that drafting and saw uh, over three years that it was still there, their worldview, they were weeping with joy for that sensibility. A scientific and indigenous worldview coming together. Um, the three parts of the intersection of the charter are ecological integrity. If the ecosystems go down, everything else is at risk. We need to preserve ecosystems. Restoration is going to be a huge work that's already emerging. Um, a very exciting notion how we're going to restore streams, wetlands, ocean areas, and so on. This is the great work that is calling our generation, restoring Earth's ecosystems. So that, that part of ecological integrity, much more complex than I'm highlighting. But the middle section is, demo, uh, is social and economic justice. The human issues need to fit into the Earth issues. So human-Earth relations, equity, um, distribution, fairness, and so on, have to be part of this, this new sensibility. And finally, democracy, nonviolence, and peace. We need democratic institutions. We need this profound culture of peace. We need those who have been working on beyond war for a long, long time. These issues, these ideals of a culture of peace to drive forward a sustainable future, because without a culture of peace, a sustainable future is impossible. So my appeal tonight is simply that this spiritual, ethical dimension that is part of the human, it happens to be conveyed in, contained by the world's religions, but this deep longing of the human for meaning that transcends buying, getting, <laughs> for a meaning that means giving into the future, giving to future generations. That sensibility is exactly one of the most important missing links for our ecological future. I think we can do it, don't you? Thank you very, very much. <clears throat>
uh, which he dates from sort of the Industrial Revolution, 1784, the, um, the, the, the sense of the, the engine of uh, industrialization. So we are definitely ending an era. Our presence is huge. But I, I love your point, and this is very much Thomas Berry's point. And when I was referring to the great work of our time, that's also what Thomas Berry is speaking about. And he's saying the Ecozoic era that is emerging is these, these new ecological economics, new green buildings, new organic, ag new and old organic agriculture, and so on. That is definitely what defines the Ecozoic era. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate the list of items that you suggested uh, religion could work with on ecology, but one of the major tools that we have to work on those things with is our money system. That is our way of communicating internationally through language barriers and whatnot. And right now our language, our money system is a, in essence bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a gold standard anymore, uh, but what we do need ecologically is a pH standard for our oceans. We need a carbon standard. And what we have with our present money system is essentially what has been borrowed or taken from the carrying capacity of the planet. I believe what we have to do is somehow address through religion, because I think that's our best tool, or our best means of addressing this tool, but we have to redefine the hammer. We have to make our money mean something that actually, when we go and trade at the store, it means something that is honest. Whereas right now it isn't. It just plain isn't. Yeah, that is such a great point. And um, I really have to add it more self-consciously. I think you're, you're absolutely right into this talk. Um, the, you know, I think I'm not one to comment on this meltdown. Many people have. But I think we all understand it as a redefinition along these lines of what we really value. You see, which is why I'm beginning here with the intrinsic value of nature is, is very much in alignment with what you've just said, um, and that we're not economic animals uh, exclusively by any means. I think what's exciting is that we have um, a number of people who've thought through ecological economics, including David Corton up here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Richard Norgard down at Berkeley, and so on. Um, there's an ecological, you know, economic society, David, um, Bob Costanza, and so on. Um, so I think we have some of the tools to do this, to make the transition. And I think these ideas are clearly moving into center practice in, in certain ways. Um, and that a re-evaluing, we can't have an economy without the Earth's economy. That's the bottom line. Um, and we, that's, we are derivative of Earth in every kind of way. There's not going to be any dividends unless uh, we have healthy ecosystems. So anyway, we could speak a lot about this, but thank you for your point. It's absolutely, I think, on target and uh, needed. Uh, when I was going through high school and making decisions about what I wanted to do in life, I was very interested in, in a very diverse family farm and um, and in, in the, enjoying wildlife. And by the time I got through college in the mid-50s, it was really clear to me that agribusiness had totally destroyed the American way of life that, that I was being raised to, to participate in, that um, that letting a um, absentee landlord own hundreds of thousands of acres um, and dump chemistry into it uh, and take you know strange uh, methods of uh, pumping water and stuff. Uh, it just um, it, it it lost the whole ethics and purpose uh, that I, I thought was important in life. Yeah. Well, again, I think many, many people in this room would agree deeply um, that agribusiness um, has been a huge downfall. And 
my husband is from North Dakota and had a family farm, and, and so we understand this, what happened, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago with the destruction of the family farm. Um, but, you know, also the, the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, is the fastest growing, you know, part of agriculture right now. And clearly, I think the whole food crisis, uh, whether it's food from China or the worry about unsafe food, even here in our own country, is, I think, going to be a driver. I mean, I, frankly, I think food and children, you know, will be the great modes of change. We have to eat every day. Healthy food, which, again, on the West Coast, I think you've got a much richer understanding of. And um, all of the religions, too, worked within these cycles of agricultural cycles and so on. You know, Thanksgiving, death, rebirth, et cetera. This is why they're not, they feed us physically, but also spiritually. So, you know, thank you for your point, and um, it's at the heart of everything, absolutely everything, food, I think. And, and the land. I think you stood up first, but... Oh, okay, I didn't see you over there, so... Hi, um, I was just wondering if you had any views on maybe how we could get some of the churches to open up to new ecological ideas, because there, as I'm sure you know, are a lot of closed-minded churches that probably aren't going to be open to a lot of new ideas, but are, do you have any views on that? I don't know any churches that are not open-minded. Well, I mean, no, I'm just like, kidding. I'm just I'm kidding. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you, it's a great question. And, um, oh, yes, the question was, how are we going to get churches to open up uh, to this more, this sensibility? Um, I did mention the interfaith power and light. Has, you know, there's more than 25 states now that churches and synagogues are doing energy audits and changing light bulbs and a whole range of things like, like that. Um, on our, we've, we've done a film actually called Renewal, which is eight case studies across the country of religious grassroots environmentalism. And we brought these people, many of whom absolutely heroic, you know, non-visible citizen-based work. We brought them to Yale last spring. We brought the scholars together. We had 350 people up at the Divinity School. It was this knowledge action synergy. It was absolutely fantastic. But there are some astounding things that are happening, ranges from Jewish um, education for children up in this camp in, in uh, Connecticut to one of the most amazing, there's a whole thing going on in mountaintop removal um, with churches very much involved, that this is a moral issue, a, a problem. Uh, there's a fascinating one in, in Chicago where farmers are raising sustainable lambs for the Muslim community in inner city Chicago. And it's a, it's a fascinating, Christians and Muslims, and then they come down, they eat together, these sustainably raised uh, lambs. Some amazing things um, are happening. So little by little, but I think it's the next generation has got to press these churches. And by the way, up on our website at Yale, and if you want to be part of the email list that comes out, every month we send out UNEP um, articles from all over the world about what's happening in religion and ecology. Um, but every one of the world's religions have statements on this. So the question is, you know, how do you bring the statements to action? Okay? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate very much what you're saying, and, but I want to push you. Um, just heard a lecture online, it's online by Charles Taylor, a, a pretty distinguished uh, philosopher on the future of the secular. It's online. If you yeah. Google it, you can find it. Um, and one, one of the points he made in the lecture was that the point of the secular is to deal with diversity and to assure maximum religious expression, maximum equal respect, and maximum, uh, well, m maximizing all different a religious as well as religious points of view. And what I'm hearing you say, and maybe I'm projecting a little bit, but what I, you want policy to be informed by religion, but it's not to me. In most of the policy issues I'm aware of, religious language drops out mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Um, in fact, it's screened out <laughs> um, in some cases. Uh, I've heard 
hearings on the spotted owl. I've been in hearings on the spotted owl where administrators say, we want to hear economic and biological facts. They don't want to hear anything else, yet most of the people in that audience are extremely passionate with uh, all sorts of views that have a dimension of depth of the kind that you're speaking of. And so I'm kind of curious about how, you know, can you cite me any policy that's informed by a multiple religious perspectives or, or one? You know, I don't, I don't see it. So. No, it's a great question. And by the way, I really also want to say, you know, that I respect the differentiation of church-state. You know, I respect a secular... I think environmentalism has a deep spiritual and secular dimension, you know, apart from religion and, and so on. We're, we're inspired by, deeply by nature, is what I was saying earlier. But Charles Taylor um, and even Derrida, the French deconstructionist, are talking about, they're concerned about the absence of the sacred in the secular, mm -hmm. okay? And Charles Taylor came to Yale last year in a huge conference on this topic, and Derrida, who you know, was one of the major deconstructionists, was very, very concerned about this issue um, of why, um, why we were trying to be so secular that we were completely ignoring the religious roots of, of Western philosophy. You see, it's very, very interesting um, yeah. stuff. So a case to speak to your question. In Israel, there's work of the three Abrahamic religions for around the Jordan River, okay? And that is a huge issue because the Jordan River is, you know, polluted, uh, the Dead Sea is drying up, um, and so on. So there's one of the great hopes is that interreligious cooperation will occur around certain problems in various parts of the world. In India, the same thing around the Ganges. There's efforts of Hindus um, to do cleanup of the Ganges. If we came back here to the states to be, you know, talk to your policy point, everybody is aware the evangelicals have spoken out a lot on climate change. They are speaking out on climate change um, for a very interesting reason. In 2002, Cal DeWitt at University of Wisconsin took a group of about 12 evangelical leaders to Oxford and had two of the leading climate scientists in the UK, who are also evangelicals but scientists, tell them the climate science. This is where Richard Sizek and a whole range of them woke up. Um, but they woke up from the perspective that they said the poor are being hurt by climate change, which is absolutely true. So there's going to be a lot of different doors to enter this discussion and affect policy. The and the, the poor is a huge one for the Jewish and Christian and, and Muslim tradition. The integrity of creation is another door, you see. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity, though, the spotted owl issue, you know, was laughed about even here and in different parts of the country because we do not have an understanding of this intrinsic value of nature. You see, and the, the religions haven't got the language yet to fully describe it. There's a center for biodiversity that Jane Elder set up in Wisconsin that, and was trying to involve the religion specifically on this, this kind of issue. But would it, let me just push you, how would it be, I'm curious, this, how would that religious language be translated or help form public policy, which is, you know, secularly neutral? That's what I don't understand. Yeah. Well, as I said, is an excellent question, and you know maybe we can pursue it further. The evangelicals have tried to affect policy. You see, they've they've done that. They've tried to press it. It's not an easy, clear thing to do, though. I totally agree. Thank you. Uh, it's recently come to my attention that uh, just the, the magnitude of the work in recovering the microcosmic relationship to, to the environment, you know, this a felt sense of relationship to the, to the ecosphere. And um, I've really been helped by some of the, well, I, I feel that the, the religious traditions are just not up to the task of the, within the individual. But I was really helped by some of the, the storytelling traditions 
and the poetry traditions uh, and ecological, you know, just nature experience, and uh, and helping and doing the meaning making with other people in the environment is such an important way to get a foothold to reconstruct a a more um, what do you call it? anthro anthro anthrocosmic anthro or I, Michael Mead calls it the mesocosm in, in the middle. Um, so I, I just give you an opportunity to speak to, to those kinds of traditions, uh, especially in the Western world where they seem to be very disintegrated. Thank you so much. Um, I am deeply interested in the poetic nature writing tradition and Orion Magazine, I've been involved with them, and um, Kathleen Dean Moore up here at Corvallis at uh, Oregon State has been... There, there's so many fantastic nature writers. We have a renaissance of nature writers and storytellers who are very much in line with what you've just said. So I would just say for the sake of time, yes, yes, yes. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. My name is Jawara. I am from Guinea, West Africa. And uh, I am here to improve my English. <laughs> So I have a, a point. I want to let you know something about uh, environmental issues in Africa. Second-hand technology trad in Africa, I mean old vehicle, TV set, uh, is also a kind of religion today. I think it's interesting to know how this problem inter interest or interfere with environment as a pollution problem. Because in Africa, we have no technology to recycle all those things. And uh, I constat, I, I see everywhere, every time, there is a, a lot of technology, second-hand products in Africa. Uh, is it possible for you to, to make something for that? If I'm understanding, did you say second-hand technology in yes. Africa? Yes. So reusing it or...? Use the technology somewhere. Oh, solar. Somewhere. somewhere. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I may not be fully understanding your question. My question is that uh, I think it's another kind of religion. Oh, technology. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, but it, dumping it off, I mean, dumping it off, sending it to the yeah, 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 yeah. is what he's, yes. he's talking about. Yes. Okay. I, I helped him Thank with you. this so far. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, again, I want, Chet, would you just raise your hand here? If you see the gentleman sitting right here, he's the person who's done a huge amount of work on this issue of technology and its effect on the human um, and education. He's an expert on this in terms of education. Okay. But your other point about um, recycling technology in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, there's an amazing film called Manufactured Landscapes, which shows this dreadful dumping all over the world. So I have nothing but empathy for your question. You know, it's, I'm hearing it in two parts. It's a very, very important question. Maybe okay. we can talk later about it as thank well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say thanks, first of all, for the inspiring talk, and especially the 10 useful points to contemplate after we leave the room. Uh, one thing you mentioned briefly, the education of women, and you mentioned food and children. And I just wondered if you had any words to say about a role for women in leadership in this in this in these directions we want to go, or if you've seen such a thing, or if you imagine such a thing. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think <coughs> academia has not been easy for a woman. You know, um, I was the first woman to be tenured in a in a department, and um, so I've had enormous support from friends and, and family, but um, it's not easy. And I do think, and I thank you for the question in this sense, I do think we really, it may sound politically correct, I, I don't, I, I want you to hear it from the heart, 
We need to hear the voices of women. <laughs> this is more than political correctness, and it comes back to the gentleman's question about poetry. The language of the heart, and I'm, again, I'm sorry, but there's a feminine language of the heart that's deeply intuitive, deeply poetic, and understands this interface of nature and humans. It, it absolutely needs to be articulated. I hope you'll be a leader in that too. Thank you. Final question. Thank you very. Does it work? Thank you very much for your most most inspiring uh, address. Uh, several decades ago, I was a foreign exchange student in North Dakota. <laughs> and, <We're told. laughs> and well, I'm I'm a Dutchman. I'm a UNESCO professor in Austria, yeah. and my my teacher of speech taught me that there are two kinds of addresses. So one is informative, and people will say that was very interesting, and we will now hear the next one. <laughs> and the other kind of speech, he says, moves, is performative. And the people react only in one way. They say, let us march. And your speech was such a speech tonight. It was most informative, but also most inspiring. And I just want to say thank you. And and I want to address one detail and challenge one point, but also reinforce you. And that is what you said about theology. Theology is a highly academic discipline in Northwestern Europe. It's, it's, one, it's an important faculty within the academia. You distinguish tonight between theology, which is a thing for the seminaries, and the study of religions, which, which is the academia. We theologians, we belong too to the academia. And so much what you have said tonight, and what you said about religions, is also at the heart of theology. Eco-theology belongs to theology. We've been fighting for that for decades. Uh, so please accept us as an ally. We are, <laughs> we are at your side. We could, not, accept. we could not have scripted a better ending <laughs> for the evening. But before we do, one more round of applause for Professor Tucker. Steve has a few things to do. Well, that's really what I hope would happen. It was, uh, you know, we, because the UNESCO chairs are meeting on Monday, and we are talking about very concrete collaborations that we are doing together. And we, I, I wanted to, to choose someone, we wanted to choose someone who would, ins who would inspire us in our discussions to come up with some very concrete things that we can do in the world. So thank you so much uh, for that, Mary Evelyn. And I want to thank all of you for coming uh, this evening. I just want to say, uh, yes, yes. Yes, it is recorded and it will be available. It should be up on the UO channel as fast as we can get it up there. So if you search the UO website or UO channel within a reasonable length of time, it will be up and available. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to uh, let people know here that this, is, this was a keynote. This is the beginning of a conference on uh, ethics, religion, and the environment. And I just want to welcome you to the other events because we're getting started uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I just want to tell you some of the things that are happening to uh, maybe inspire you with the voice of a man, if that's possible, uh, to, to come. <laughs> yeah. I try very hard. Uh, 
I have no choice, actually, and, and I'm happy for that. I'm happy for that. So, uh, in the, at 1 o'clock tomorrow, we're going to begin with uh, the Dean of the Honors College, David Frank, who is going to give us a very, very interesting and very timely and important talk on the founding of UNESCO. Uh, and uh, I think that will be very interesting. And again, his talk is at 1 p.m. in the Ford Lecture Hall of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. We're also going to hear from Stein Willemstadt, the Deputy, Secret Deputy Secretary General of Religions for Peace. And he's going to talk to us about a very interesting proposal for an initiative for a decade of intercultural and interreligious dialogue uh, in the UN. And he's uh, asked us, or we, we as UNESCO chairs are going to consider uh, whether we should be advocates for this and how we might be able to be advocates for this. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a panel discussion, once again, on very concrete projects that we can adopt to address the ecological crisis at 3 o'clock tomorrow. And we want to open that up to everyone here. We're, we're having people, we would like to have every possible uh, religious and spiritual tradition represented, but in the interest of time, we're just going to stick with four. And so on the panel are going to be uh, Bud Lane from the Native community, uh, Imam uh, Mamadou Touré, who is with us this evening, uh, and uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Husbands Hankin, uh, and again, Islamic and, and Jewish community respectively, and then John Pitney and Jenny Holmes from uh, the Christian tradition. And we are going to, and uh, uh, Mary Evelyn talked about uh, Bartholomew One and how important he's been to this whole uh, uh, movement. And I just wanted to mention to you that he's, an, uh, he is, uh, the traces of Bartholomew One are very much part of this conference because we're going to be capping off Mother's Day tomorrow with really an extraordinary musical performance by a group called Capella Romana. And they are, have very close ties with Bartholomew I. They, they specialize in chants of the Greek Byzantine tradition. And we're going to be treated to an extraordinary composition by uh, an advisory board member of our center, Robert Keir, who's a composer and a member of the faculty here, who has written a, a piece called A Time for Life, which combines in its libretto Native American uh, reflections on the environment, along with text from the Greek Byzantine tradition. And so that's going to be very special. It's at 7 o'clock, isn't that right, uh, Terry? Tomorrow evening in Bell Hall as part of the Vanguard series. Please join us. And we very much hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks so much for being with us tonight.